So let me switch gears to investor behavior. Um, I might have shared this book with some of you um, a few years ago. It's a great book, and if you want to understand why investors behave poorly, this is a very good book written by James Monche. He's very knowledgeable. It's very funny, and it's not that long, so it makes it a readable book. And I would recommend that for anybody who is interested in this space. The question is, can the right asset allocation improve um, behavior, uh, in individuals' investment behavior? And our belief is that it can. So we are the enemy, and the proof of this comes from studies that are done each year by a company out of Boston called Dalbar. And Dalbar does this study where they measure tens of thousands of investor accounts, and they go back 20 years each year to determine what returns those investors made by buying either uh, stocks or buying mutual funds that invest in U.S. equities. They also do this for fixed income on bonds as well. And what they have found is every year, what you're looking at in the green is what the stock market return is, the 20-year stock market return, and what is in red is the average equity return. And last year, for example, just in, or the year before last, when the last survey came out in 2013, um, for the previous 20 years, not for one year, for the previous 20 years, the average investor underperformed the market by 4% per year for the entire 20 years. Now, to appreciate the significance of this, and I've used this phrase before, so stop me if you've heard it, but if you took 12 lobotomized monkeys and simply asked them to choose investments for you, you would actually get the green line. So the real question about behavioral finance is not whether this actually occurs, it's why does this occur? There has to be a reason. Why do individuals act so much against their own interests? Surely they would at least like to get market returns. So a few years ago we wrote this um, newsletter about this, but this is all in the Montier book as well. There are four primary reasons why essentially we do not get the outcomes we should get. So the first is prospect theory. Prospect theory says that if I think I'm going to lose a dollar, I feel twice the pain as if I'm going to make a dollar. So I will do anything to avoid losing it, including not selling an investment I should have not, never had in the first place. The second thing is over-optimism. If I did a survey of this room and asked everybody to write down on a sheet of paper, put up their hands, are you above average, and then just came up with a whole shopping list of things. Are you above average? Are you above average good looking? Are you above average intelligence? Are you an above average driver? Um, it, it doesn't really matter what the question is. 80% of you will put up your hand for every question. So they've, you know, it's, it's, it's everybody believes they're in the gifted program, which is a, a great thing if you're just trying to be optimistic and positive about life. It's not so good if you're trying to get better results in the market. So, so in the studies that they've done, they try to determine who would get better results. Is there a class of people that would get better results than the average group of individuals? And they could only come up with two groups, those who are clinically depressed and uh, weathermen. <laughs> the next thing is cognitive dissonance. Basically what this means is we filter out information that disagrees with a decision that we've already made. So if we have bought an investment, we automatically will shut out information that suggests that maybe we have the wrong investment. We filter automatically. And finally, the one I like the most is gambling with house money. And, and you probably know this from your experiences at going to a casino uh, occasionally. If you're lucky enough to go in there and get ahead by $1,000 you know, in the first couple of hours, the first thing you say is, I can afford to bet big because it's not my money. Well, okay, just think through this rationally. If the money's in your pocket, it belongs to you. So the, that, the reason the casino exists is because they know you're going to do this, right? So essentially, what happens is you bet bigger after you've won. In the way the equity markets or any other markets work, what it really means is the faster the market rises, the more people are willing to put a bigger investment in that asset class, even though it's obviously going to be closer to a point where it's going to turn negative. So the actual best practice is to reduce your winners and rebalance 
on a regular basis. And let's talk about predictions for just a second. So I'm, I'm, I'm going through the internet looking for outrageous predictions, and I find this one up here called The Great Crash of 2015, written by a guy named Michael Lombardi. And you can sign up for the newsletter. This guy predicts that within six months, this year, this entire equity market is going to implode. So I thought I'd do a little bit more research just to see if this guy had any serious credibility, and I found this blog below, written by somebody else, on December 11th, sorry, on December 2011. So this was written three and a half years ago. And guess what this guy says about the same guy in Lombardi? He just keeps repeating himself in six months, even though the original six months has passed. Reminds me of the end of the world prediction minister who was wrong twice and then said he would stop. So what happens, of course, is that these guys can keep doing this because a lot of people don't go back to the website and new people coming say, well, you know, this guy sounds like re really reasonable, so I should buy his newsletter. When you look at the world's wealthiest people, they're saying that they, should in they, they think the U.S. is the place to invest, but when you look at one of their brethren, Mark Faber, very well-known investment guy, um, predicted exactly 12 months ago that in the next 12 months, we would have a crash of 1987 proportions. And for those old, not old enough to remember 87, in that year, the market dropped 23% in one day. So Mark has two more days to fulfill his prophecy. And I only mention this because when you're looking through the media, you are going to see more and more of this because this is what sells the media. And this is what is very much a distraction in making good investment decisions. So in terms of managing volatility, let's take a look at what we could do. Do you remember, I shouldn't, you can tell how old I am. I'm asking, I'm asking you to remember the 70s. You know, I, I'm just thinking, you know, how many people here are 30? They weren't even thought of back then. You know, I, I love this picture. Do you remember Jane Fonda getting arrested? That's Jane Fonda. I mean, remember ABBA and platform shoes? I love platform shoes because it's the only time in my life I've been over six feet. And of course, every heterosexual male had a major crush on Farrah Fawcett at the time. You know. So the 70s were very interesting, and I picked them because I wanted to take a look at what's happened with equity markets from 1970 to today. And 1970 was a very rough turning point in equity markets. A bear market was starting, and it lasted a long time. And this is the volatility. This is the ups and downs of the equity market, the uh, S&P 500 from 1970 to 2014. When I went through it, I found the following. 80 months, or 15% of the time, that would be roughly two months every year, your tra trailing 12-month return was worse than minus 10%. So just imagine getting your statements and realizing that your return, you'd lost 10% from the year before at least twice a year, okay? And in terms of just getting a 0% return, that happened 25% of the time. It's for these reasons that people get poor results in the market. This is a lot of volatility. But it depends on how you look at the market. If we had invested 100000 in 1970, and we just invested it in the market today, that would be worth roughly $2.5 million. But if we also took the dividends from those same stocks and put them back in the market, not trying to time the market in any way, we would have today nine and a half million dollars. The difference between these two is the price has gone up by 7% a year, the total return by 10. The difference is the dividends, which are 3% a year. But 3% a year over a lifetime of investing changes your wealth by a factor of four. So we spend far too much time focusing on the price of an asset and not nearly enough on the cash it generates. So let's look at it from a different perspective. You're in 1970, you retire on $100,000 and you just clip coupons. You don't even think about the price of your stocks, you just take the dividends. So what happens is you start with an income of $3,700 a year, which is not unreasonable, and more or less every 10 to 12 years, it doubles. And that dividend is amazingly consistent. It's grown by 6% a year, which is 3% a year more than inflation. If we take a look at it compared to the price, it's one quarter of the volatility. It only had negative returns 14 months out of the entire 40 years, as opposed to 80 months for the price. You can't predict the price. 
but you can predict the cash flow that's coming out of, that, of those stocks with a high degree of certainty.